Hi, everybody. My name is Emily Schwartz. I'm a clinical dietitian specialist out of the Metro Detroit area, and I'm here today to talk about IV or intravenous fluids. Now, it's tricky because this isn't a topic that's routinely taught for dietitians, uh, especially not at the undergraduate level and oftentimes not even in our internships, but it's something that's incredibly useful to understand when you're in clinical practice. Up to 80% of hospitalized adults will require IV fluids at some point during their hospitalization. So if you're working with hospitalized patients, chances are you're going to encounter IV fluids. So let's talk about it. Now, before we get into talking about some of the specific fluids themselves, let's do just a quick review of the fluid compartments of the body. And I'll get into why this is important to understand in just a moment. The total body of water is made up of our intracellular, extracellular, and transcellular fluid compartments. The intracellular fluid compartment is exactly what it sounds like. This is the fluid within our body cells. It accounts for about 65% of total body water. So this is our largest fluid compartment. We also have the extracellular fluid compartment. This accounts for about 32% of total body water. And this includes both the interstitial and intravascular spaces. The interstitial space includes the lymphatic system and the fluid surrounding individual cells. And this takes up about three quarters of the extracellular fluid. When we talk about third spacing, fluid is going to this interstitial or third space. The intravascular space is the fluid within the bloodstream or the blood vessels. And this is what we're concerned about when we are talking about blood pressure or circulating volume. So this is the space that we're concerned about in those scenarios. We also have the transcellular fluid compartment. This accounts for only about 3% of total body water. And this includes specialized fluids like cerebrospinal fluid or, or gastrointestinal secretions. Now, the reason it's important to be able to conceptualize these different fluid compartments is because of the concept of shifting. So when we're looking at different electrolyte abnormalities, acid-based disturbances, fluid imbalances, we're looking at oftentimes a shifting of fluid between these different fluid compartments. Now, the mechanisms between how this shifting occurs and why is really beyond the scope of what we're talking about here today. But just know that IV fluids uh, are not distributed equally amongst these different fluid compartments compartments and different fluids are often chosen based on how they will distribute. Now let's talk about some of the most common IV fluids that we see in clinical practice. Now fluids in the hospital are classified chiefly by their sodium content, which determines their tonicity or their ability to shift water between the fluid compartments. The most common fluid that we see is what's known as normal saline or 0.9% sodium chloride. This is an isotonic fluid, so it's the same tonicity as the bloodstream. The sodium concentration of normal saline is 154 milliequivalents per liter. So this is the fluid we use when the patient simply needs more volume, then we use an isotonic solution. We may also see hypotonic solutions. Uh, one example is half normal saline or 0.45% sodium chloride. So this is exactly what it sounds like. This is half the sodium concentration of normal saline. Now we use hypotonic solutions when the patient needs proportionally more free water than sodium. So for example, if we have a patient with an elevated serum sodium level or hypernatremia, they may require a hypotonic solution to bring that serum sodium level back down. We may also see completely sodium-free solutions like D5W or 5% dextrose in water. Um, again, this is a, an even more hypotonic solution that we use if the patient needs much more free water than sodium. Now you may notice that anything less than half normal saline requires dextrose. And that's because our fluids that we use intravenously need some sort of solute and able to deliver the fluids to where we want them to go. Um, if we're providing just plain free water without adequate solute, that puts the patient at risk for hemolysis, which can be very dangerous. And so you will never see just plain water infused intravenously. Um, we always need some sort of solute. So if it's less dilute than half normal saline, there will always be dextrose added. We may also see hypertonic solutions. So we may see 2% or 3% saline solutions. Uh, we may also see more balanced salt solutions. So they may consist of um, sodium chloride and some combination of sodium acetate as well. Now, these are very, very concentrated solutions. So if you look at the percentages, they're more than two to three times as concentrated in terms of sodium than our normal saline. 
And so these hypertonic solutions are typically used in one of two different clinical scenarios. Uh, one is profound hyponatremia, where our patients have very low serum sodium levels, and we're trying to bring those levels up. And another one is uh, certain types of neurological conditions that put the patient at risk for cerebral edema. And so this comes back to the concept of shifting again. And I always picture this type of scenario as like a river running through the brain. So we're providing very concentrated hypertonic solution in that river, and it pulls free water out of the brain cells in order to bring that river back to equilibrium. And so that is what helps the swelling in the brain cells by giving that hypertonic solution. We may also see other types of solutions as well. Uh, one example that is very common in surgical populations is lactated ringers or LR, and the content of which um, is shown here. So we have uh, a little bit less than normal saline concentration. Lactated ringers consist of 130 milliequivalents per liter of sodium. And this is, again, what we consider more of a balanced salt solution. So oftentimes our IV fluids are containing sodium chloride, which it contributes to our acid load. It's considered more of an acidic salt. And sometimes we don't want the patient to get all of that acid load. We may want them to get a little bit more base component. And so lactated ringers is a great example of this. So some of the sodium comes from sodium chloride, but some comes from sodium lactate, which is a more basic salt. Lactated ringers also contains a little bit of potassium and a small amount of calcium as well. Another solution we may see in clinical practice are bicarbonate drips. Now, bicarbonate drips are more often seen in the intensive care unit setting. Uh, now, it, this again goes back to that concept of acid-based salts, but this is a completely basic solution. So there's no sodium chloride in there. Uh, the sodium all comes from bicarbonate. And this is used most often for patients with acidosis where we're trying to uh, buffer that acid in the patient's body and we're trying to provide a more basic solution. This may contain one, two, or three amps of bicarb where each amp is 50 milliequivalents of sodium bicarb. So if you think about this, we have either 50 milliequivalents, 100 milliequivalents, or 150 milliequivalents of sodium bicarb, which brings us back up to that isotonic concentration. Now, all of the solutions I've talked about so far are what are considered crystalloid solutions. So these are fluids with small molecules dissolved in water. We may also see colloid solutions, which are fluids that contain larger molecules to keep fluid in the intravascular space. These may be especially helpful during critical illness and times of capillary leak or third spacing. But their efficacy and specifically how long their effects last are debated. And I know in my experience, this really comes down to the managing physician and what their personal stance is. I've worked with physicians who love using these solutions and they use them regularly. And I've also worked with physicians who feel that these solutions are really effective while they're being provided. But then as soon as you stop that fluid, the patient goes back to how they were before because it's not treating the underlying cause of the third spacing or the capillary leak. Uh, but in any case, there are several different types of colloid solutions. Some of the more common ones include HETA starch and IV albumin, among others. So because IV fluids are so common in the clinical setting, it's not surprising that we have a number of different indications for them. So one of the primary indications for IV fluids is fluid resuscitation, which is the correction of acute hypovolemia or intravascular volume deficit. This is most commonly seen in the emergency or intensive care unit setting where patients may be decompensating from volume depletion. This can occur from cases of hemorrhage, sepsis, burns, or other conditions that lead to decreased circulating volume and shock. So the concern here is that the patient doesn't have enough circulating blood volume to adequately perfuse the organs, and this can result in end organ damage. And so IV fluids help to boost circulating blood volume and improve organ perfusion. Another indication for fluids that's commonly seen in the hospital setting is for replacement or maintenance. And so this is for patients who are not able to maintain adequate hydration through oral means alone. In a sense, IV fluids also serve as a base for parenteral nutrition, IV medications, or IV electrolyte replacements. Now, the amount of fluid in these products varies. Sometimes it may be significant, sometimes it may be more negligible, but it's really helpful to know and be aware of what the patient is receiving, both in terms of how much fluid and what type of fluid it is especially if there are major fluid or electrolyte abnormalities taking place. So there may be times where we want to know exactly how much fluid that's, that patient is getting or um, exactly what types of electrolytes that patient is getting. And so these are times where we may need to really get into the weeds with it. 
beyond the need of hydration and fluid for a patient, there may be other therapeutic indications for IV fluids, uh, most of which I've already mentioned. This includes the use of hypertonic saline for hyponatremia or cerebral edema, bicarb drips for acidosis, or IV albumin for third spacing. When it comes to documentation and practical applications for the dietitian, here are a few things to keep in mind. First of all, we want to check the rate at which those fluids are infusing. And I know this has tripped up a lot of students and interns that I've worked with. All of our electronic medical records are different, of course, and orders always can look different between the different records. But oftentimes orders may list the size of the bag, but not the actual rate that the patient is receiving. And so we want to not get tripped up by that. The 1,000 mLs that's listed there may be how big that bag is, but the patient may not be getting that much. So we want to make sure we're looking at the rate at which those fluids are infusing. We also wanna determine what is a maintenance fluid versus what is a bolus fluid. So a maintenance fluid is one that's running at a rate over time continuously. Bolus fluids are ones which are infused in a large amount over a short period of time. And these are used to acutely increase typically blood pressure or urine output. We also want to clarify how additives are provided. So are they being provided per liter as is the case generally for example, for potassium, or are they being provided per day, as is the case for multivitamins, or they should be if they're ordered correctly. So we want to make sure we know exactly how those are being provided so we know how much the patient's receiving. We also want to consider IV fluids when managing nutrition support. So never assume that someone else is going to take care of that IV fluid when you start your nutrition. Sometimes they will, if you have an astute nurse or physician who's paying attention, but oftentimes this kind of falls to you to be aware of this and make sure that this is getting done correctly. Now it looks different for every patient, but often for enteral nutrition, we're going to be ramping up water flushes and decreasing IV fluids as the patient tolerates those feeds and as appropriate for their uh, fluid status. For parenteral nutrition, we're often discontinuing IV fluids when that parenteral nutrition has started. However, for those who have high losses or who have high fluid demands for whatever reason, we may choose to add an additional maintenance IV fluid as needed or a fluid replacement like an NG tube replacement fluid if necessary. For those who don't have order writing privileges or who don't yet feel comfortable really getting involved in IV fluid management yet, that's okay. We can still just be another set of eyes for that patient situation. So as you get comfortable with this and you learn more about fluids, you can just kind of pay attention and notice, for example, does the patient have profound hypernatremia and they're receiving normal saline, but they maybe benefit from a more hypotonic solution um, or the reverse. Do they have profound hyponatremia and they're receiving hypotonic fluid? Are there opportunities where we can recommend little adjustments here and there? Uh, now, with that second one, there are situations where this may be appropriate, but it still warrants communication to the rest of the team if you can't see a clear reason why this might be ordered. With hyponatremia, if the sodium is being corrected too quickly, a physician may order a hypotonic solution to slow that, that rate of correction down. But again, sometimes things simply get overlooked. So if you can't see a rationale for something, it usually doesn't hurt to ask. I know I have learned a lot over the years simply by asking my colleagues why they ordered something, and most of the time they haven't even been offended. Another thing to consider is whether something can be added to the IV fluids, such as a multivitamin, thiamine or folic acid, or a potassium. Now, when it comes to adding some of these things to the IV fluid, we also have to take into consideration the fact that many of these additives are frequently on shortage. And so we have to think about, can that patient take that thing orally? Can they receive it through a feeding tube or do they need to get it in that IV fluid? Um, so just kind of some things to think about from a practical standpoint. So thinking about all of this information and all of this knowledge, let's kind of review a patient case and think about some things that we could recommend. So we're following up on a patient who was recently started on enteral feedings. This patient is a 75 year old male who was originally admitted with a CVA. He has a history significant only for hypertension and prior knee replacement. He failed a swallow evaluation and elected for a PEG placement to meet his nutritional needs while he undergoes rehabilitation. The PEG was successfully placed and bolus tube feedings were started the next morning. So overall, this has been relatively uneventful. We are following up two days later. His tube feedings are now at the prescribed goal of 1.5 kcals per ml of standard formula, 360 mLs or 1.5 carton boluses four times a day. 
He's receiving 60 ml water flushes before and after each feeding bolus, an additional 360 water flush Q day, and additional water flushes with medications as needed. We estimate based on all of this that he's receiving 100% of his nutritional needs, including fluid needs. The patient is also receiving maintenance IV fluid of D5 half normal saline with 20 milliequivalents per liter of potassium fluoride at 75 ml per hour. The patient is beginning to get edematous. Today's serum sodium is down to 133 millimoles per liter and potassium is 3.4 millimoles per liter, both of which are kind of borderline low. So what are some changes we could recommend? Well, looking at all of this, I would recommend that actually that we discontinue the IV fluid. The patient appears to be getting fluid overloaded and his needs are already being met through the enteral feedings and through the water flushes that are being provided. However, the patient still appears to be needing that supplemental potassium because even with the potassium in the IV fluid, his level is still borderline low. So what I would do is talk to the physician about stopping the IV fluid and potentially adding a daily potassium replacement, such as a 20 milli equivalent potassium chloride, either oral or through the PEG tube as needed. So in summary, there are a number of different IV fluids used in clinical practice and each have their own specific properties and uses. The vast majority of our hospitalized patients will require IV fluids at some point during their hospitalization. And because these fluids play a direct role in hydration and fluid balance, it really behooves us as dietitians to develop a level of comfort with how and why these different fluids are ordered. So as always, collaborate with your teams to make sure that everybody's on the same page, that your patient is protected, and that you can continue learning and educating. I hope you found this helpful. Thank you for joining me. Mm -hmm.